Well, what is going on, HSM? How are y'all doing tonight? Y'all doing good? Four of you are doing good. That's so great. I'm so glad the four of you are doing good. Well, hey, I'm really excited about being with you all this evening. If you did not bring an actual physical Bible with you, run and grab one of those real quick. Uh, we're going to be, or if you've got your Bible with you, you can open up to Luke chapter 17. Luke is one of the Gospels and the New Testament. So if you flip back to the New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, then Luke. So it's on the tail, on the back end of your Bible. But if you get to all those letters like Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, you went too far. Luke 17, Luke 17. Yeah, we're going to be starting off in verse 11 here in a little bit. Well, um, I, I don't know if you have experienced this in your life. Uh, and sorry to start off on like a, a downer moment, but I, I had a friend of mine, a dear, dear friend, uh, that died of cancer a couple years ago. And uh, leading up to his death, like it was evident that like the time had come. He had had multiple battles with cancer. And this was a man who, while he wasn't like biologically family, he was family for us. Lindsay and I, we thought of him as a dad. All my kids, they called him Papa. Like we loved, loved, loved this man. And he had multiple battles of cancer and this was the last one and this is the one that ultimately took him. And, and as it was getting near to the end, like it was evident, like we, there's just like maybe weeks left, the, the conversations changed. And maybe for you it wasn't in a death, but maybe in another circumstance you've experienced this where all of a sudden the, the tone of conversations got a little bit different. For, for us, with, with Alan, the kids called him Papa, like there was a turning point where as, as he was going, like the, the, there was an urgency to the conversations. We always said how much we loved each other. Like we didn't miss a moment to like say the things that was really on our heart and our mind. So we told each other often how much we loved each other. I remember one day, and this is like really close to the end, we were over at his house and we we're visiting him and, and he clearly wanted to share with us things about his life. So he pulled out all these pictures, pictures from his childhood, Pictures of him on a drum set as an adult. Pictures of him in his favorite motorcycle that he had. Picture of him with this mustache that I never knew he had, and it was an awesome mustache. There was an urgency because there was a finality. We knew things were about to change. And maybe for you, you've had a, a similar circumstance where there was some sort of triggering thing, circumstance that brought urgency to a conversation. What I think about and what I wonder when I think about Jesus and the Gospels is as he was nearing the cross, I think there was a difference in the conversations. I don't think the disciples necessarily picked up, well, maybe they noticed something was different, but they didn't know what was coming, but Jesus did. So I, I think that there was a different urgency in the way in which he communicated and spoke and taught and talked to them. One of the things that Luke says a little bit earlier in his gospel is that Jesus had shifted his focus and he was resolutely focused on Jerusalem. And so now Jesus is nearing the end when he knows what's about to happen. And I think there was just incredible intentionality all through his time with his disciples. But here there's a turning. And what Jesus is doing, Jesus has, been, has always been focused on his mission and preparing his disciples for their mission. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at a moment, a miracle, a healing that Jesus did. And we see how this is to help us understand the mission that he's on, but also the mission that we've been invited to be in as well. Now, one of the things I just want to remind you, maybe you know this, or maybe this is brand new information for you, but the, the Bible, your Bible, it didn't actually fall from the sky, leather bound and all those books all together. It didn't actually fall from heaven. I don't know if you knew that or not, but the Bible is written over a long span of time but by a lot of different people who were inspired by the Spirit. And Luke is one of the accounts of the life of Jesus. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't there for all the things. 
But what Luke did, who this guy was really brilliant, he was a doctor and he's basically like a historian, the way he recounts these experiences. He spent time with the disciples. He probably spent some time with Mary, the mother of Jesus. He spent time with a whole lot of the people who were followers of Jesus, interviewing them, asking them a whole lot of questions, learning and discovering all kinds of things. And then he sat down and he took all the things that he had heard and then he wrote an account a, 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 and put together uh, an understanding of the life of Jesus. Now, I believe he was inspired by the Spirit, but there's also a massive human element to this. You have to recognize that in Jesus, in his ministry, there were a lot of things that happened that were never recorded in Scripture. Like, there must have been so many other things. I mean, he had three years with his disciples, and we don't have three years' worth of stories and tellings. And so there were certain things that just left such a big impression on the disciples that they told them over and over. They reminded them to each other over and over. They were counted often. And this is one of those significant stories. This is a moment that stood out so much for the disciples that they retold it often enough that it left an impression on Luke that the Spirit used to make sure it was included in his gospel. So with that said, we're going to look and see this incredible miracle as Jesus has shifted his focus to Jerusalem and he's preparing his disciples for the mission ahead. And there's an urgency, there's an intensity, there's an intentionality to everything Jesus is doing. Luke Chapter 19, verse 11. We're going to have the verses up on the, on the screen for y'all as well. And as you go along, and if you want to journal or write anything, or if you like to make notes within your Bible, there's some different things we're going to let you know that you can underline here. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, so Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, and this is ultimately where everything comes to a, a huge like whole thing where he ends up on a cross. On his way to Jerusalem, Je- uh, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. So Jesus is making his way. He's on his way to Jerusalem. On that journey, 10 men with leprosy met him. Now there's 10 people with leprosy all together. And it's not like this like, oh, what a random coincidence. 10 people with leprosy. The reason there would be 10 people with leprosy all together is because leprosy was a disease that in the Old Testament, what's one of the things it says in Leviticus is if someone has leprosy, they need to leave the camp. They have to be removed from their family and friends and live in isolation so that no one else could get sick. So what would happen is for these people who have leprosy, and this is an awful, awful disease for so many reasons. We're going to talk about that in a second. But they would, because they've been exiled from community, they would find community with each other. So here's 10 of them who are all together trying to like make it through life with this awful disease. Now, if you've grown up in church, you've heard people talk about leprosy before. There's, it's mentioned in the New Testament a lot. Today, it's called Hansen's disease, and it's actually something that is still a disease that's in the world today. There's, um, and you can find it in different places. I've read some things recently about from a doctor who is in India who's treating people with Hansen's disease. This is a bacterial disease that attacks your nervous system. And one of the things that is really hard about this disease is that you actually, it messes with your sense of touch and you no longer recognize when there is pain. Now, I don't know if any of you had COVID. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands if you had COVID, but maybe you had COVID and maybe you lost your sense of taste or maybe your sense of smell. I remember when I had COVID, I couldn't taste very good and I lost my sense of smell for a while. Now, the most dangerous thing that could have happened to me because I lost my sense of smell is drinking some bad milk. That was really like the worst case scenario for me, losing my sense of smell. It actually worked out nice. There was a lot of things that smell terrible that I did not have to smell, mostly myself. But here, if you lose your sense of touch and you no longer feel pain and you live in a culture where you farm for your food, that's a problem. If you live in a culture where your sense of the way in which you warm your body is at a fire, not being able to feel pain is a problem. 
This doctor that was in India, one of the things that he was writing, I read this, he had this story where he talked about how he had a rusty lock with a key and he was trying to turn this key in this lock and he could not turn the key. And this 11-year-old boy with Hansen's disease, leprosy, went, took the key and turned it and cranked the key all the way around. The doctor was amazed and thought, how strong is this 11-year-old boy? But it wasn't because the boy was so strong. What happened is, is he noticed that blood was dripping from the boy's hand. And it's because he did not sense the pain as he was turning this key, and he ripped all the skin and the tissue all the way off of his thumb, exposing the bone. This is how this disease is really hard, hard and awful. Here, here's a picture of someone's hand that has leprosy, and you can see that it just, ultimately, they get injury after injury after injury. And it wrecks their body because they can't feel pain. They get bruises and gashes and beat up all the time, and they don't even know it. And it's an awful, awful disease. It begins to, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. It begins to uh, do different, th there has other effects on their body, this bacteria and their nervous system. It can affect the larynx. So you could actually recognize the person has leprosy from a distance if they're calling out because their voice changes. Their body's covered with awful, awful wounds because of the fact that they've lost their sense of pain. And unfortunately for a lot of these people, you can smell them from a distance because their body is just massively infected. It's a hard life. So imagine what it would be like in this time in history for people who were Jews. They find out they have leprosy and they realize my life is about to get physically awful. And then because of the law and the Old Testament, what they also knew is now not only is my life going to be physically hard, it's going to be relationally hard because they just got booted from the camp and they can no longer be with their support system. They've lost their connection with their family and their friends, and they've been completely exiled to live outside of the city. Such a sad, sad state of existence, these people who had leprosy. And so here, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way, and here, 10 people who have leprosy are calling out to Jesus. They stood at a distance because this is what they had to do. They weren't allowed to approach people. It was against the law. They would get in a lot of trouble if they actually approached people. So they're standing at a distance, and they call out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, even though they weren't in the cities, even though they couldn't actually make it in to hear Jesus do his teaching or see all his miracles, they knew enough about Jesus. Somehow word got to them that, one, they should call Jesus master. Somehow they knew that there was something remarkably different about this man and that he was a man with power that they should call master and a man with compassion who may have pity on them. So they said, Jesus, master, would you have pity on us? They are in a state of desperation, and they've heard about this man. I mean, he's been, this is the tail end of his ministry now. They've heard about this man. He's been healing people for three years. And I just wonder if this group of 10 people who had leprosy were hoping one day this man, Jesus, might make his way past their little camp. And sure enough, this is the moment. And so they yell out in a loud voice, hoping that maybe something might happen for them. And they say, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And then look at what Jesus says. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. Now, Jesus is Jesus, and he's done a lot of miracles up to this point. And he did something a little different here. There were a lot of times where Jesus said, be healed. And what happened? Like they were healed right away. Jesus could have done this in, that mo in this moment. This is what he did so often. As he would just like, all right, here you go. Shazam, and people are healed. He was doing wild things all along the way. But here he does something a little different. He doesn't say you're healed. He says, Go. Show yourselves to the priests. Now, the reason he's telling them to go show themselves to the priest 
is because the, in the Levitical law, it talks about what the priests are supposed to do. And one of the jobs of the priest is if somebody has leprosy and then they think they've been cured of it, they're supposed to go and show themselves to the priest. And they spend eight days with the priest. He's kind of like, uh, I don't know, not a doctor, but like is over like disease, like a CDC kind of a thing, right? So here now the priest is supposed to let people know if they've actually been cured of leprosy. And if they get a blessing from the priest, then they're allowed to go back to their family. And so Jesus doesn't say you're healed. He doesn't heal them in a moment. Instead, he says, go show yourselves to the priest. And because these people with leprosy probably had a lot of wounds and a lot of injuries, I think some of them may have walked and I think some of them may have hobbled. And they started making their way to the priest. But he didn't heal them right away. He invited them to start walking by faith. That's what he did. He said, go, show yourself to the priest. Let's go to the next verse. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and go back. And as, oh, sorry, go back. And as they went, they were cleansed. So he tells them, go, show yourself to the priest. And they, some of them are walking, some of them are hobbling. And this is one of those things. I, I love to just try and think about what the moment might have been like that Luke is recounting. I wonder how far they were going, how many steps it took, what the distance was when all of a sudden they began to be healed. And the word here used for heal is actually a word that would be used that they were made whole. So I don't know if some of them were missing fingers and fingers regrew. I don't know how, like what all the holding was and the healing that they had, but the leprosy was gone. Like all of a sudden at some point, maybe I think I wonder if that wobble actually just began to be a walk, which turned into maybe like a hop and a skip. But they regained all of their sense of feeling and pain and everything was restored for them. And it says that they were made whole. As they went, they were cleansed. God healed them because they walked by faith, believing something was going to happen. Now, let's go to the next verse. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So here's 10 people. All of them have leprosy. They ask for pity. They ask for a healing. Jesus says, go to the priest and show yourselves. 10 of them start making their way to the priest. And as they're going, all of a sudden they're getting healed. And so imagine like the first guy is like, wait a second, I'm getting healed. And he's like, and you're getting healed and you're getting healed. And like the momentous energy that must have happened as they all 10 of them recognize they're beginning to get healed. So now they're high-fiving, they're arm pumping, they're dancing maybe, they're super pumped and they're making their way, they're heading to the priest because they got to get a priest to give them a sign off on being able to go back to see their family. I wonder some of them, some of them are like, I finally get to hug my wife again, see my kids, see these other people who I've missed for so long long. And as they're going to the priest, all of a sudden one of them goes, hey, y'all have a good trip to the priest. I'm going back to Jesus. And this man goes back to Jesus. And I don't know, this is where I speculate and this, I don't know if this is true or not, but I like to think that the one who went back to Jesus might have been one of the ones whose voice was really raspy and really messed up with leprosy. And now he comes back and he says he, th- says he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him, but he came back praising God in a loud voice. Like, remember, This is a story that the disciples had told over and over again that left an impression on Luke. This moment stood out to the disciples. Like this guy came back and he was so loud. Like super loud in his worship. Super loud in his praising God. So he comes back and he begins to praise God in a loud voice. Throws himself at the very feet of Jesus. And he thanked him. And here's the punchline. Here's the kicker in the whole thing. This guy 
the one that came back was a Samaritan. He wasn't one of God's chosen covenant people, the Jews. And what God has always been up to is wrapping his arms around all of humanity, even the marginalized and the most outside, pulling them in. And this man, this Samaritan, was healed. And he came back. He was the returner, made his way back, got to the feet of Jesus, and worshiped him there. Look at what Jesus says in response. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Now we read this, and, and I don't know if this is something that you struggle with. I, for me, I grew up and I just always kind of put some shame into what Jesus was saying in a wrong tone. I don't, I don't know if you've ever done this, but when I was a kid reading this, I was like, this is how I imagine Jesus saying this. We're not all 10 cleansed. Like he's like kind of angsty about it, maybe shaming a little bit. But Jesus isn't shaming the other nine. The other nine are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. He said, go to the priest. And they did what he said. So he's not upset with the nine. What he's doing is he's trying to get us to focus on the one. So that's why Jesus says, we're not all nine cleansed. Where are the other nine? He says, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This word foreigner here that Jesus used, it's not a word that would be a mean word or a harsh word or something that's judgmental. It's actually pretty fascinating because this is a word that would have been written inside the temple. So for the, for the Jews in Jerusalem, they had a temple that they could go to, and this is where they worshipped, and this is where they believed God's presence was. It was in the Holy of Holies at the temple. So the way the temple was set up is there was like this outer area where everybody could come in, and this was called the Court of Gentiles. And then there was a wall that was right inside of there, not like a huge wall, but like a little wall. And on this little wall, it said foreigners cannot go any further in. So the word foreigner there is the same word that would have been used that would have been on a sign on this wall. And this was to let everyone know who's not Jewish, they can't get any closer to God. And then there was a, the court of women. Sorry, ladies, this is a patriarchy, and it was not great, and it's not right, and this isn't how God works. But there was an outer area where women could only get to, and then guys could get a little bit closer, and then priests, and then the high priest could go to the Holy of Holies. So there was like this exclusion kind of a thing that was happening as people got closer and closer to God, to where his presence is. This is one of the things I love so much about how the te- with the temple, when Jesus was sacrificed, the curtain was ripped from top to bottom, and his presence came out into all the world, into all of humanity. And there's no separation, Jew, Gentile, male, female. But in this time, for them, there was a separation. And here's what's so wild, is at the end of the eight days, when someone who was cleansed of leprosy, when they would go to the priest, at the end of those eight days, the last thing they were to do is to go and make a sacrifice at the temple. But this Samaritan would never have been able to get past the wall where it cuts off the foreigner. But he went not to the Holy of Holies, but to the Holy One and worshiped at the feet of Jesus. So here's a couple things that we get to see from this incredible passage of what I believe Jesus wanted his disciples to understand. I think this is the impression that it left on them, and this is what we can take away from it as well. One is these people who had leprosy, they walked by faith, and they were healed. And this one man came back, and he was brand new. See, what the disciples saw is that here is a person who walked away in one place and then came back brand new. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we are made new in Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus, you were made completely new. You are healed at the core of your being and your spirit. And you are a brand new creation. And you have the spirit of God in you, which means you have a new nature. What actually comes natural to you is to follow the will of God and to trust God. But we often find ourselves deceived by the flesh, desiring things that is actually not what we really desire. 
you have a new nature, a new identity. You're a new creation, fully forgiven. So when you put your faith in Jesus, you were made brand new. And here's what I believe the lifelong journey is for all of us as followers of Jesus, is understanding how alive we are in Christ. This is what it means to, under, to be, we're not becoming more Christ-like. You already have all of Christ in you. But the journey of this life as a follower of Jesus is us discovering how alive we are in Jesus and how new we are in him. So I believe that's one of the things that the disciples took away from this, that when you put your faith in Jesus, you're made brand new. Another thing I think that we can take away from this, and this is one of the things, it's just this time of year, November, it's Thanksgiving. It's a time of communicating thanks. We all feel grateful but we often forget to communicate our gratitude. Those nine that were healed, they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They went to the priest. And they, the, I'm sure the priest was overwhelmed with like, here's these guys and he's got to hang out with them for eight days and he can't deny the reality of God and Jesus and the fact that he is powerful and has a lot of compassion. I think for those nine guys who were healed, I think they told this story over and over and over again for the rest of their lives. Like, I think their story was, we were going, along, we were there and we saw Jesus and we called out and he said, hey, show yourself to the priest. And we started walking and my hands were restored and my, my hobble turned into a walk. I think they told this story over and over again and talked about how much Jesus changed their life. But there was one that didn't just feel grateful. There was one that actually went back and communicated gratitude. And so we all often feel grateful. We feel grateful to God, but sometimes we come and we don't communicate our gratitude in worship or in our devotion or in our prayer life, and that's normal. We are going to struggle with that. And the same thing's true in our relationships. God has used a lot of people in your life. There's a lot of people that God has used in my life who I am grateful for, but I don't always remember to go and tell them, thank you. Like, I forget to actually do the thing and go and say, thank you for letting God use you in my life. One of the things that we see Paul do in his letters, when you read the New Testament letters, is he thanks people. Often in the beginning or the end of his letters, he's intentionally communicating gratitude. He's not just feeling grateful for these people. He actually says to them, I want to thank you for loving me so well. And so as we're in this time of thanksgiving, here's why I just wanted us to take some time, and this is what you're going to spend most of your small group time talking about tonight. Who are the people that God has used in your life that you feel grateful for, but maybe you never actually went and told them, thank you? Now I'm just going to go out on a limb. I'm going to guess that for many of us, it's our parents. I bet your parents have done a lot for you and you've probably forgotten to thank them. I mean, maybe you've thanked them for some things. But when was the last time you looked at your mom or your dad and just said, thank you? You've got small group leaders who love you dearly. And I work here at the church. I I sign a lot of the checks. I don't write your small group leaders a check. They're doing this because they just love you. And I bet you thank them from time to time. But when was the last time you looked them right in the eyes and said, Jesus has used you to change my life, and I'm so thankful. And I bet there's a lot of other people, some friends that you have, some coaches, some leaders, who God's used in a significant way in your life. And this isn't something to feel shameful about. I've got a long list of people that God's used in my life that I forgot to thank. I haven't called my mom in two weeks. She just called me and I rejected her call because I was worshiping. So I'm going to call my mom tonight and I'm going to say, Mom, thank you for loving me so well. 
Hey, let me pray. I don't want to take any more of our time. I want you guys to get to small group. Jesus, thank you so much for loving us so well. And Lord, I pray that um, you are reminding us of the people you've used in our lives. And it's not about us elevating the person. It's about us recognizing you and your spirit at work through them. And Lord, I pray that you um, help us to grow and be better at really communicating and sharing gratitude, not just feeling grateful, but actually saying thank you, that we are people who are givers of thanks. And God, thank you so much for this moment and this miracle. Thank you for doing this the way you did for those 10 people, but also for it to leave the mark that it left on the disciples that ultimately is leaving a mark on us in our lives. Jesus, you are full of compassion and you are all powerful. You are good and we're loved by you. And Lord, if we've got some students in here tonight who don't know you, Lord, I pray that you're helping them understand more and more what it means that they can put their trust in you, that they can walk by faith believing that you are a healer and that they experience healing in you, that you make them new. And if they're curious about what it means to start a relationship with you tonight, I pray that you embolden them and encourage them. Give them the boldness and the courage to talk to a small group leader or a leader tonight to ask questions around what that would mean to put their faith in you. We love you, Jesus. And I pray there's wonderful small group discussions tonight, beautiful moments where people are vulnerable and that your spirit is at work as we share and as we listen. In your name we pray, amen.